And Daram here say, whenever I leave the house, and on whatever thing my eyes fall on, Sabr. Allah Ta'ala says, Wallahu Lifu Sabirin. Allah Ta'ala is lifted out of Kina. School governing body of South Coast Madrasa. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على حبيب رب العالمين سيدنا ونبينا محمد نبي الرحمة كاشف الغمة وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا الحمد لله we began before Zuhr by looking at the significance of the Sunnah and how do we connect to the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that the Sunnah that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam himself is the greatest gift that you have in life so we must recognize that gift and we said you recognize that gift how you recognize it with your mind and through knowledge through recognizing the centrality of the messenger وسلم, in your recitation of quran through study of his person example life and guidance but the mind alone is not enough you also need to stir the recognition of this gift by stirring your emotions so that the heart is stirred and moved and that is by gatherings of remembrance and praise of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the gatherings of celebrating the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That's the first part. The second part is that if you recognize the gift, you must express your gratitude. And the way that Allah out of His mercy has given us to express our gratitude is by sending blessings on the gift of guidance, the beloved messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Right? And we encouraged each of us to have a routine, a daily routine of sending blessings on the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And if one doesn't have a routine to begin, if nothing else, then by sending a hundred blessings upon him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, by day and night. And then, one must strive to live that gratitude, that love towards the belovedness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But a fallacy is that very often, if let, let me ask this question What is love of the Prophet? Or what is the most common answer if you say, What does it mean to love the Prophet? What is the most common answer that you can find? Anyone? What does it mean to love the Prophet Sallallahu <coughs> If you said one thing, what would it be? Sorry? <laughs> to follow his example. Okay. And this is one of the, the most blatant miss understandings and travesties that affects our sound approach to religion and life. That to love the Prophet ﷺ means to follow him. If one was being rigorous about it, this 
is actually a misinterpretation of Quran. If you say love equals following, there's a number of problems. One, purely rationally, I know a number of people here who employ others. Do you, and we, we asked one of the dear brothers, do you have employees? Do you have employees? Yes. Do they follow you if you give instructions? Do they love you? I mean, some might, but the average employee, do they love their boss? I mean, we wish, right? Any, any of us are in situations where you're the boss, right? You wish they love you, but they probably don't, right? I mean, they may do their job, but few, if any, love, right? Love is not following, following is not love itself. Following is entailed by love. Okay. The Qur'an makes that clear. That love comes first, then comes following. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Qur'an, commanding the beloved sallallahu alayhi wa sallam himself, قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهَ فَاتَّبِعُونِي Say, if you love Allah, then follow me. Allah, and Allah will love you. But there is a condition. If you love Allah, you say, in kuntum Allah. If you love, then follow. So what comes first? Love. Is it possible to follow without love? Yes. You could follow the Messenger, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. But if the love of Allah, the love of the Messenger, is not the foundation for the following, it does not result in belovedness to Allah. Why? Because following that is not grounded in love may be functional, but it is not fruitful. It may be actualized but the following may be actualized but that following will not be beautiful the following of a lover is not like the following of any other so we must pay attention to the aspect of love and what is it that moves the believer it is love why do we feed why do we do good it's clear in the quran they feed others ala hubbihi yut'im wa yut'imuna ta'ama ala hubbihi miskinan wa yatima wa siyam. They feed others not because it's good, not because it's right, not because they care, but because they love. And the, fee, the, the good done by lovers is not like the good done by any other. It is more intense more beautiful, more caring, more merciful, more impactful for them and for others. <coughs> so this is very important. Following is the essence of realizing your relationship with the Prophet ﷺ. But the root of that relationship is love. And it's very clear in the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ said, none of you believes لا يؤمن أحدكم لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى أكون أحب إليه من والده وولده والناس أجمعين. None of you believes until I am more beloved to them than their parents, their children, and all people. He did not simply say none of you believes until they follow me. Full stop. No, that following is required, but it must be rooted. It must be rooted in love. But then, for the love to be true, there must be proofs. Right? There must be proofs. And the proof of the claim of love is the following. But the following that is out of love, otherwise it's not proof. Why are you doing this? Because I'm a Muslim. Good. But that's not love. I'm doing this, I want reward. That's not love. 
I'm doing this because I want Jannah. That's not love. That's transaction. That's like you're the employee. Sayyidina Ali ibn Abi Talib, Karramallahu wajah, he said that the servants of Allah are of different types. There are those who are the fearful servants. They just fear. So they, they do works. There's those who are like traders. I will give you this if you give me this. And it's a trade relationship. I'll, I'll pray to have you give me a castle in paradise. Okay. And Allah is generous. He gives. You ask and He gives. But there's a higher level, which is out of love, right? And that's what we must strive to stir. But the proof of that love, and we've emphasized, we must stir the love. The proof, though, is manifest in how we live, in how we live. One of the great scholars of our times and a very respected caller to Allah, one of the very distinguished students of Habib Umar bin Hafiz, Habib Hussein al saqqaf who's of, of, from the Ba'alawi family of great scholars and righteous, um, but he is based presently in Dubai, in the Emirates, and, and he has an excellent website and weekly lessons, and particularly if you know Arabic, he has hundreds of lessons on, and he also has a number of lesson sets that his students do live translation of in English, and you can benefit a lot from him. He's one of the really distinguished scholars of our times. He says, Maratibul Iman Tadharu Bil Mu'amala. The levels of faith are manifest through one's life dealings. And the Sunnah is manifest not simply by doing things in one's personal life. The heart of living the Sunnah is how you deal with others and why you deal with others in the way you deal with them. And how do you live and deal with others in a beloved manner? That's the test of the Sunnah. The Prophet ﷺ said, the closest of you to me in the hereafter will be those who are best in character. And character is how you are with other people for the sake of Allah. And that's one of the functional definitions of good of character. So we're going to look at aspects of upholding the sunnah in one's living, seeking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala thereby. And given that we're in this wonderful facility and where we have Al-Ghazali College, I thought it suitable that we look at one of the sections of a, one of the greatest works of Imam Al-Ghazali. This is called Al-Arba'een Fi Usul al-Deen. 40 foundations of religion. And this work is essentially a, sum, a summarization by Imam al-Ghazali himself of his magnum opus, Ihya Ulum al-Din, of which you know, the revival of the religious sciences, of which Imam Nawawi, one of the great authorities of Islam, said that if all the written works of Islam, if all the authored works of Islam were to disappear and only the Ihya remain, it would be sufficient. That's how great a work and how comprehensive and how transformative a work it is. Of course, it's hyperbole because Allah has promised to preserve the deen. So the works of this, the, the authored works of this deen would, the authored works means besides the Qur'an, besides the teachings of the Prophet Sallallahu And it's hyperbole because Allah, Allah is guaranteed to preserve the deen until the preservation of the teachings of the deen. 
But this tells you about the centrality of that book. Imam al-Ghazali summarized that the central teachings of that book in a much shorter book, which is just one volume, a mid-sized volume, depending on the, uh, the edition between 150 and 200 pages, called Al-Arba'in Fi Usul al-Din, The 40 Foundations of Religion. And there is a summarized translation of this, translated by uh, Professor Harun or Aaron um, Spavek, and it's available. Um, but a complete translation has not been published yet. A number of people have did at various times start it. So Imam Al-Ghazali looks at the sunnas of relationships with others. Because the sunnah shows us how you turn to Allah. And that's the easy part of the sunnah. Even a simpleton would realize that if you worship Allah, might as well worship according to the worship of the Prophet right? That's simple to understand. Right? But, and you have a self, an obvious self-interest in doing so. Because if you pray, you find benefit. If you pray according to the sunnah, you find more benefit. Right? And you in readily would incline towards it. The other personal sunnahs are easy once you get going. The challenging sunnahs are the sunnahs of dealings. Why? Because in the sunnahs of dealings, your inclinations may point in one way, but the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ may well point in the other. You may be driven by self-interest, but prophetic concern may be pointing in the other. And to be able to uphold the sunnah and its high standard and its virtue and its excellence and its beauty and its mercy and its justice and its balance in dealings with people, that is the test of what it means to be a believer. It's the test of what it means to be a follower of the Prophet It's the test of what it means to be a lover. Which is why a man came to the Prophet And the Prophet ﷺ was with other people. And he came facing the Prophet ﷺ and he said to him, Ya Rasulullah, ayyul amali afdal, O Messenger of Allah, what action is best? So the Prophet ﷺ said to him, Husnul khuluq, good character. And we said, what's, what's good character? To be good in your relations with others for the sake of Allah. Now, but, you know, we understand good character to be something simple. Be smiling, be cheerful, be nice, and that's good character. Some man was disappointed. He wanted a big answer. So he went away. And he came around from the right side of the Prophet ﷺ and said, Ya Rasulullah, ayyul amali afdal. O Messenger of Allah, what action is best? So the Prophet ﷺ turned to his right because he didn't respond to someone just by turning his head. If he turned to someone, he would turn completely. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So the Prophet ﷺ turned to him completely and said, Husnul Khuluq, good character. Man still wasn't satisfied. So he, he walked away and came around from the left of the Prophet ﷺ and said, Ya Rasulullah, O Messenger of Allah, what action is best? The Prophet ﷺ turned to his left and said, Husnul Khuluq, good character. Man still wasn't satisfied. So he came, went around, came from behind the messenger وسلم, and said, now this is the fourth time he's asking the same question in the same gathering. Exactly the same way. So he said, Ya Rasulullah, Ayyul Amali Afdal. O Messenger of Allah, what action is best? And the Prophet وسلم, turned around and he said, Ala tafqa. Maybe you don't understand. Good character. And like, and he said, good character. And he gave him an explanation of it. He didn't say, didn't I ask you bef answer before? Don't, you know, what's wrong with you? He just responded for a fourth time in the same gathering to the same question. And the guy was trying to be sneaky as well. Just, good character is for you not to get angry when you have reason to be angry when you are able to be angry. 
That's the best of actions. And from that the ulama say that that it is not just good character, good character is not just getting angry, but you understand from that, that what is the basis of good character is restraint. Right? This, is, this is called isharatul nas. For those of you who've, who've studied usul al-fiqh, we understand meanings from texts at various levels. What is explicitly mentioned in the text Ibaratun nas, the expression of the text, but also what is indicated, the meaning indicated by the text, which is called Dilalatun nas. So also Isharatun nas, it's a meaning understood from the text, but it is not what the text is directly about. But it's understood from the text. So you understand from that, the key to good character is being able to restrain oneself. Right? And many other meanings are understood. But the Prophet ﷺ referred to good character, how you are with people, as being the best of actions. And there's many hadiths on that. So we look at 20 central sunnas and we'll encourage you as we go through to, to ask your questions. Imam al-Ghazali opens this section by emphasizing that fulfilling the rights of others is an integral of the religion. Fulfilling the rights of others, he says, وَهُوَ رُكْنٌ مِنْ أَرْكَانِ الدِّينِ And a rukun, an, an integral, is something that a, another matter is built upon. Right? It's a pillar. If you take a pillar away, you endanger the whole edifice. That's the role of the rights of others. <laughs> Why? He explains. He says, this is because the meaning of religion and this is a beautiful definition of religion. What is religion? Imam al-Ghazali says, What is religion? This is because the meaning of religion is journeying to Allah. That is religion. And then he says, if religion is a journey to Allah, that's your destination point. Religion tells you how to get there, and how to get there right. So if you're on a journey, and it's understood we're journeying with other people, so it says, and from the integrals of travel is keeping good company with those you're traveling with. Because you can't get there alone. You can't get there alone. The journey is long, and on your own, you won't get there. But if you're traveling with other people, then you're responsible, one, with respect to them, to be good to them and also to get the journey done practically like if you're a boss if you order people around etc and just act like a dictator eventually people say well i quit okay you know you could say well i'm gonna get my way with my husband eventually he's gonna get away you, you keep you say i'm gonna do whatever i want in my marriage it ain't gonna work eventually Something's got to, got to give. Sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima Hatta tanalu jannatan wa na'ima Sallu alayhi Sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima Hatta tanalu jannatan wa na'ima Sallu alayhi So what is nasiha? Advice. It's not. Otherwise the hadith would make, how could all of religion be giving advice? Okay. And the people most of us are most scared of in our community are the people who throw around too much advice. Right. Nasiha refers to sincere concern, caring. And because you care for the good of another, you may give them advice. And it's sincere concern, why? The Sahaba asked, to whom? To whom is this nasiha directed? He said, to Allah. Can you advise Allah? So obviously, nasiha is here does not mean advice or counsel. And that's a mistranslation. Because you, if you try to advise Allah, if you really mean it, you're either deluded or a disbeliever. It's like Allah is in need of your advice. And Allah is ghaniyun anil alameen. He is in no need of his creation. 
Can you advise the Quran, the Prophet? Of course not. Right? So it is the religion itself is sincere concern. Right? That is the essence of religion. So that's the first thing. So we make a commitment that if you love Allah, if you want to express your gratitude, then when you deal with others in any relationship, social or work, have concern for their good as you have concern for yourself. And there's levels of concern. Not everyone is expected to immediately be preferring others to themselves. But the least of concern is don't harm them. Don't vitiate their rights. Don't neglect what is due to them. That is the do no harm. If you can go above and beyond that and do good to them, take care of their better interest, that is superior. And higher than that are many levels of highness. And you see in the Sunnah, amazing examples of preferring others to oneself. Any questions here before we continue? Okay, so the second sunnah of excellence in social dealings is to be humble with everyone. Right? Be humble with everyone. To have tawadu. And not to arrogate yourself, nor consider yourself better than anyone else. And tawadu, humility, is at the heart of prophetic character. The Prophet ﷺ used to sit with his companions. He used to eat what they ate. He didn't actually, even when he talked, he talked while sitting amongst them. But the Sahaba insisted that the Prophet ﷺ sit in an elevated place. One, because they wanted to express their love and respect for him. But secondly, for practical reasons. Because if you're sitting amongst them, those sitting away couldn't see him. And they couldn't hear him so well. So they insisted and when they explained why, the Prophet ﷺ acceded to it. So they had a little mound on which the Prophet ﷺ sat. And that's why in the Prophet's mosque, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they, they built, they had the mihrab. So that he could be seen more clearly. Otherwise he didn't. He disliked distinguishing himself. But what is humility? What is tawadu? Can someone try to describe to us what is humility? Anyone? Like what does it mean to be humble? Respect uh, others. To respect others? That's an expression of humility. Right? But sometimes there, there, there is, they say there is, there is true humility. They say this broadly there's three types of humility. There's false humility, true humility, and real humility. Right? False humility is when you think you're amazing, but you pretend you're not. So you walk into a gathering, you say, bunch of losers. But I'll pretend to be a normal person, right? Assalamu alaikum, sister, how are you doing? Or if you're a brother, Assalamu alaikum, how are you? MashaAllah, this and that. You think, what a bunch of losers. Like, I'm so much better than them. For whatever reason, whether for religious reasons or worldly reasons. But, so you think you have higher rank, but you pretend you don't. That's false humility. Right? And then true humility, is when you don't think you're better than others. That's true humility. When you don't think you're better than others. Why? Could be for a number of reasons. But there is real humility, right? Perfected humility. Ibn Atayla says that Real humility is not that you think yourself better than others 
and then to pretend that you're not. But rather, real humility is that you do not behold yourself your, before the greatness and majesty of Allah. True humility is from consciousness of Allah. That you know how great Allah is, so you don't think anything of yourself before the greatness of Allah. And it comes from Tawheed. That true humility is the one, is the state of one who is humbled by Allah. How is it realized? One by humbling oneself to Allah and by not caring about love of self, but rather caring about love of Allah. Right? And this is one of the central qualities of a believer. Right? Central qualities. How do you realize this humility? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands the Prophet وسلم, in Surah Al A'raf, verse 199. Hold fast to overlooking. Be easy in overlooking others. Because if you don't, it's because you think something of yourself. He wronged me, he this, she that. Me, me, me. That's the underlying message. That goes against humility. So, be khudil afu. Be easy going. Hold fast to being easy going and overlooking. What bil urf. Uphold the good. Right? And turn away from the ignorant. Don't. Someone's, and the ignorant here is the one who acts foolishly. Either they're acting foolishly themselves or who acts foolishly with you. Because acting with jahl is to act in a wrong way. So they're being wrong, turn away from them. Don't respond to others' ignorant conduct with ignorant ways. Right? And this is, and this is testing. Because if you do good, it's easy to ascribe good to yourself. And this is one of the dangers of mechanical Islam. Because if you think, I, if the focus is, I am following the Prophet I am doing this, I am doing that. What are you doing? You're inflating your ego. And it will be manifest. It is only when the motive behind it is Allah and gratitude to Allah and love of Allah that the good that you do would humble you. Would humble you. Why? Because doing it for Allah would make you realize that Allah deserves better. Doing it out of love would tell you that the beloved that deserves better than th this little good that you've done. Gratitude entails recognizing that Allah's blessings and gifts are greater than your expression of gratitude. So, sincerity, just doing it for Allah, love, gratitude, all of them should humble a believer. And if your increase in religious practice does not increase you in humility with Allah's creation, it means that you're lacking these three meanings. You're lacking sincerity, you're lacking love, you're lacking gratitude to Allah. So this is one of the ways you take yourself to account. If you find yourself looking down on others, thinking yourself better than others, then what's its treatment? You have to work on your sincerity, your love, your gratitude. The third is an expression of that. Is to respect elders and to be merciful to the young. The Prophet ﷺ warned very simply, لَيْسَ مِنَّا مَنْ لَمْ يَرْحَمْ صَغِيرَنَا وَلَمْ يُوَقِّرْ كَبِيرَنَا The Prophet ﷺ said, whoever does not, whoever is not merciful to our young and not respectful to our elders is not of us. Meaning they're not following our way. 
And this is directly related to humility. Right? And humility, of course, comes from being self-centered rather than being Allah-centered. It's when your governing concern is me, rather than your governing concern being the Prophet Right? And it's manifest. Why? Because elders can be overbearing. Kids, young people can be annoying. Or you can say both can be annoying. And since there are many young people, and those who are older, please don't take offense, because it's, it's the words of your Lord. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran that old people will annoy you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in Surah Al-Isra, verses 23 and 24. And if you want to know how you should be with your parents, look at this verse and try to bring it into your life. These two verses. Your Lord has decreed that you worship none but Him and that you have excellence to your parents. But then He says, if one or both of them reach old age, then don't say uff to them. Again, it's an if then relation. If they reach old age, then don't say uff to them. There's something necessarily implicit in the text. This is called Dilalatu Tadammun. There's something necessarily implicit in the text, which is, if they reach old age, what's unstated? They will annoy you. So don't say uff to them. Because there's no relationship between old age itself and being annoyed. Is that old age will inevitably result in them either being annoying or you getting annoyed. So don't say uff to them. Don't express even mild exacerbation, mild disapproval, let alone being rude, etc. So, old people will annoy you, and young people are kind of crazy anyway, so they'll annoy you for sure, like kids or whatever category there is, right? So one has to take this very, very seriously. And we have to check our, check our conduct with those older than us. How? Again, it goes back to love. Right? All these things, we don't do it because I have to. You don't do it because they're so nice. They might not be. But you do the right thing Lillahi ta'ala, for the sake of Allah. And if you do it out of love, anything you're called upon to do proves much easier. So that's respecting elders and being merciful. One of the great innovations of, in our community is the next sunnah in social dealings. As a community, we are far too serious. Right? Very often, this doesn't apply to all masjids, and mashallah, you know, many of the masjid here are much, and this one in, included, it has a much more positive atmosphere. But a lot of masajid, and sorry if, if it's not politically correct to say, a lot of masajid feel like graveyards. You go in there, and it looks like someone just died. Even many Muslim gatherings, many Muslim marriages, you go, someone's getting married. Everyone's sitting there looking like, like who died? Did they switch the event from nikah to janazah? And yes, the poor groom might feel that he's, you know, been, he's just been assassinated because he's having second thoughts about why he's getting married to this dangerous lady called Zubaydah. Hey? I guess I was one friend of mine a week before marriage said, I'm having second thoughts. Why? I said, because she's such an awful person. I said, then, <laughs> you know, this, you know, this saying in Urdu, kis bichu ne kata? Right? Like, what? Which? Which kind of moth bit you? Like, who, what have you been bitten by? Do hey, you want to do it? Don't. If you're doing it, might as well enjoy it. Like, be happy. It's, an, it's a bid'ah. 
It's a bid'ah, not, you know, it's a bid'ah to be gloomy and unsmiling in the general case. Why? Because there's no one who was more cheerful and more smiling than the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Right? And this is you know, one of the important sunnahs. Right? To be cheerful, smiling, he says, and yakuna ma'kafatil khalqi mustabshiran talq al wajh to be with all creation. And Imam Ghazali is an Imam. He uses his word, we be with all creation. This doesn't just apply to other people. Why? Because you don't we don't smile at people. We smile with our Lord. The sunnah of smiling isn't that you see someone and say, Assalamu alaikum. We shake our heads if you're still got daisiness in you. Okay? Like when we went to Pakistan for a few months, honestly the most miserable months, of, it was hard for me to smile while I was there, but had to. Okay, sunnah, but my, my older son said, Abuji, why do they shake their heads here so much? Because, you know, they were, my kids were born when we were in Jordan. And Arabs don't shake their heads like we, we do. Um, so why do they shake their heads so much? And he's a thoughtful kid. So then you say, is there, are there, do, is there a system to how they shake their heads? And I guess there is. Um, but we, the sunnah, right? The sunnah isn't to smile at other people. The sunnah is to smile. Imam Ghazali says, with all of Allah's creation. All the time. Why? Because the heart of the believer strives to mirror the prophetic state. What was the state of the Prophet? <laughs> Should I not be a servant who is truly grateful to Allah? If you recognize the gifts of Allah, that He, has, he is gifting you at every moment with the gift of existence, the gift of life, the gift of faith, the gift of guidance, the gift of good. The, the gifts of Allah upon you that are the greatest are the gifts that are always with you. So you should be grateful. And if you're getting gifts consistently, and you're grateful consistently, so who receives a gift saying, Oh, Jazakallah khair, and they're crying, right? If you are drowning in divine gifts, if we just knew what a tremendous gift it, ha it is to have the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you would be cheerful and rejoicing. This is a command in the Quran. Say in the bounty of Allah and in His mercy, in that let them rejoice. This is a command. It's a command no less than the command to pray fast and give zakat. And the Prophet upheld it. Can Rasulullah The Messenger was constantly smiling. Mutawasil al ahzan yet always sorrowful. But his sorrow was not worldly sorrow, his sorrow was spiritual sorrow. It was a sorrow out of awe before Allah. It was a sorrow out of a deep sense of caring for Allah's creation. Just as his happiness was not worldly cheerfulness, it was spiritual joy. And now we may not feel that spiritual joy, but we strive to stir it which is why the believer if you're alone working on your computer how should your how should you outwardly be because the outward outward changes the inward you should be smiling you're sitting alone what should you be doing you should be smiling that is the sunnah and why is it the sunnah because you are supposed to be grateful to god in every moment and that's why the Prophet ﷺ said, Ajaban li amril mu'min. How strange are the affairs of the believer. Because every state of theirs is for their good. And that's for no one but the believer. Whether pleasing things happen or displeasing things. As the Prophet ﷺ mentioned in the rest of the hadith. Even the sorrow of the believer 
is a happy sorrow. Even the sorrow of the believer is a happy sorrow. And that's the marvel of the sunnah. I, I mentioned this hadith frequently, I did mention it yesterday. It's such an amazing hadith. It's like when someone asks Sayyidina Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha wa an abiha, that tell me something amazing about the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa She said, what could I tell you? Every state of his was amazing. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah. But it's mentioned in the Shama'il of Imam Tirmidhi. And you can read further on this amazing hadith there. That once the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi was in his household, surrounded by his family, when the hadith says a daughter of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi was bought, brought to him. But it's actually the daughter of his daughter, his granddaughter was brought to him. As an infant, she was on the verge of death. The Prophet Sallallahu took this, his baby grandchild, baby granddaughter, into his noble arms by his blessed chest Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And she died. Um Ayman, who was like a second mother to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. She screamed and started crying. And the Prophet ﷺ looked at her and said, Ya Umm Ayman, ma had al buka? Oh, Umm Ayman, what is this crying? Umm Ayman looked at the Prophet ﷺ. She raised him when, his, when the Prophet ﷺ's mother died on the, in, outside Medina. Who took the Prophet ﷺ back to Mecca? It was this noble woman. So she looked at the Prophet ﷺ and said, Ya Rasulullah. Alastu araka tabki, O Messenger of Allah, do I not see you crying? And the, the beloved Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, said, "Hada leesa bi buka." This is not crying, and he had tears coming down his noble cheek. He says, "Inna ma huwa rahma." This is but mercy. He's he's just lost his granddaughter. He said, "I'm not crying." Meaning, I'm not crying with the crying of loss. This is the crying of care. This is the crying of mercy. And then he said something. And this, he's holding his own granddaughter who's died in his noble arms by his blessed chest. He said, Inna al mu'mina bi kulli khayrin fi kulli hal. The believer, meaning the true believer, the true lover of Allah, the true grateful servant. إِنَّ الْمُؤْمِنَ بِكُلِّ خَيْرٍ فِي كُلِّ حَال The believer is in all good in every state. Why? Because the greatest good you have is the good that never leaves you. The gift of faith, of life, faith, guidance, the gift of the messenger, the gift of the Qur'an, it's there. So if you have the greatest good possible, everything else, how, how much does it matter? Which is why the Prophet ﷺ was always content. Was always content. But it's a contentment with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. جنة ونعيما صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما حتى تنالوا جنة ونعيما صلوا عليه